let me tell you one of the greatest stories of survival the world has ever seen. In the early 1900s, groups of explorers set out on expeditions to make their mark in human history to be the first to reach the South Pole. In the race to reach Antarctica, a rivalry formed between two Englishmen, Robert Scott and Ernest Shackleton. In the end, it was a Norwegian explorer, a man by the name of Roald Amundsen, who would reach the pole first. Shackleton would have to complete a feat even greater if he wanted to become part of history. This became the heroic age of Antarctic exploration. Having lost the race, Shackleton begins the early stages of an expedition to top Amundsen, a feat never before attempted, convincing various private donors, as well as the British government, to fund his new expedition. Shackleton buys a ship named Polaris, subsequently renames it to the Endurance, and forms a crew of 27 brave men. In his journal, he writes his family motto, Through endurance, we conquer. The great aim of this expedition will be the solving of problems in the interest of geographers and mariners all over the world. This will necessitate the exploration of an entirely unknown region on the Atlantic side of the Antarctic continent. As is shown by our map, this great icy track has never been penetrated. If Sir Shackleton safely achieves his object of crossing the whole continent from Weddell Sea to Ross Sea, he will be the first man to have trodden these regions. By 1914, Shackleton would have a plan for a new, highly ambitious, yet highly dangerous endeavor to be the first to achieve an overland crossing of the Arctic continent. This would famously be known as the Endurance Expedition. It is a journey from sea to sea of 1,700 statute miles. Its difficulty and danger are greatly increased by the fact that the explorer hopes to cover entirely new ground and that he cannot, by the nature of his route, have the advantage of a chain of food depots like those which have been so material an aid to his predecessors in Antarctic discovery. He will, however, be helped by the resources of science in a way which was not open to many of his forerunners. Things were rather thrown together at the last minute, usually short of cash, and the thing was just driven by his amazing energy. Shackleton and his crew set sail in the summer of 1914. Immediately they are hit with increasingly worsening conditions. Heavy flows and bergs continuously impede any sort of progress. By January 20th, 1915, the Endurance is trapped. Interestingly, none of this phases the faith the crew have in Shackleton. But when you're in a hopeless situation, when there seems no way out, get down on your knees and pray for Shackleton. They decide to wait out some of the ice pack. A month goes by. Nothing. 18 feet of ice holds the ship between huge slabs, refusing to relinquish its grasp. In retaliation, Shackleton decides to try to move the ship manually. For two straight days, he and the crew attempt to unearth over 300 tons of oak and fur to try and move it back out into the water. Finally, they manage to break some of the ice surrounding the front, and they push the ship backward. Shackleton quickly climbs above to take control of the helm, now the only person aboard, and decides he'll use the stern of the Endurance as a ram, a desperate attempt to break through the ice and reach the open sea. He comes within 400 feet. By February 24th, Shackleton finally gives up on the ship. The Endurance is now a winter station, acquiescing to the drift aboard the ice. And still, the crew refuses to waver. They still have faith not only in Shackleton, but in their mission. They think, no, believe, that they will complete their goal. Not once does their situation impact any of their spirits. They play footy on the ice, sled dogs become pets, they drink cocoa, maintain chores, play chess and dress up, and listen to records. For three months, this resolve is untested. Then, one night in April, ice begins to shove up against the Endurance once again. Any attempt to relieve the pressure quickly becomes futile. They hold like this for months. In July, the pressure of the ice is so loud that recounting speak of it as a living nightmare. The crew stays up all night in dreadful watch of the assault, and this goes on for weeks. Finally, on October 18th, a wave of pressure keels the ship over by 30 degrees. A week later, Shackleton orders the crew to abandon ship. Having nowhere to go, the crew now camps out on the ice in front of the wreckage. Shackleton now has to decide how to keep his crew alive. A supply depot 346 miles away, abandoned on the nearby shore of Paulet Island, becomes their sole lifeline. 
Within days, the ice at last takes the endurance beyond repair. They watch as masts break apart, sinking into freezing waters. For six months, the crew live as nomads, camping as they move across the ice pack in an attempt to reach the depot. They eat seal and penguin to survive. By March 1916, supplies run dangerously low, and Shackleton is forced to give the order against the surviving dogs. Almost two years since they began their expedition, and 14 months of being marooned, they come devastatingly close to Pollitt Island, only a stone's throw away, but are stuck aboard the pack and watch as they slowly drift past its shores. Then in April, with the warming spring weather, the ice beneath their feet cracks wide open and begins to take the small lifeboats they've been pulling along out into the sea. They have no choice but to board them and pray for survival. For days, they drift aboard the roaring seas, 20 degrees below freezing. Thirst becomes so unbearable that the tongues of the crewmates begin to swell so bad they are no longer able to swallow what little food they have. Through 17 hours of darkness each day, Frank Worsley, Shackleton's navigator, is somehow narrowly able to keep their boats together, dazingly sailing towards the way they hope is the closest coast. Miraculously though, by sheer luck, resolve, and tremendous perseverance, the crew make it to the shores of Elephant Island. It's the first time they've felt solid ground for 16 months. 800 miles to the northeast, far away on South Georgia Island, lies a small whaling station. Realizing this may be their last attempt at salvation, Shackleton decides to attempt the journey and leaves a note for his men. You can convey my love to my people and say I tried my best. Yours sincerely, E.H. Shackleton. The next morning, Shackleton and five other men board one of their last remaining boats and wade back into the sea, leaving 22 men behind with nothing but hope and optimism that their captain would return. For 17 long, strenuous days, Shackleton sails the cold Arctic Sea yet again. On May 8th, the crew finally get a glimpse at South Georgia Island, but the waters are too rough and treacherous that they spend two more days simply attempting to make the landing on the shore avoiding rocks and wave after relentless wave. When they are finally able to land, they survey their surroundings and realize they've reached the side of the island on the complete opposite of the whaling station. They'll have to walk miles, traversing towering glaciers and mountains no human has ever crossed before, only estimating the direction they'd have to travel. Too exhausted to go any further, two of the men reluctantly stay behind and wait. One night, as they cross the top of a mountain, Shackleton and the remaining crew encounter an incredibly steep slope impossible to either hike or climb down. Staying would mean dying to the elements. So the three men settle on tying themselves to what remaining rope they have, secure themselves together, and hold one another for dear life. They toss the rope over the edge, not knowing whether it even reached the bottom, and push off over the edge. It's a thousand foot fall to the rock below. And still, they survive. At 4 p.m. on May 20th, 1916, bruised and tattered beyond recognition, Shackleton at last walks into the whaling station, meeting a sailor he's known for years. Don't you know me, he asks. The whaler hesitates. I know your voice, and the response comes. My name is Shackleton. Some say at that moment, the sailor turned and wept. After three days, Shackleton launches his rescue expedition for the remaining men on the shores of South Georgia and those left behind on Elephant Island. It takes him three months to even find them. But there, standing on the beach in shock and complete disbelief, are the 22 men desperately awaiting the return of their captain. Almost two years since they began their expedition, the crew finally safely go home. Even though they've failed their intended mission, Shackleton and his men achieved something equally as important if not greater. They conquered their own lives, a living embodiment of the expedition's motto, masters of their own fate. These men didn't just survive, they endured. In the winter of 2022, a new journey is underway. Dan Snow and History Hit lead an expedition on the search for the wreckage of Shackleton's endurance. In freezing weather, similar to what Shackleton's crew faced in 1914, History Hit sent state-of-the-art equipment 3,000 meters deep to survey the sea. Day and night, an underwater drone continuously remains on the search. Meanwhile, the crew above encounter the same challenges Shackleton faced over a hundred years ago. 
history hit is now also stuck in the ice. After a few weeks, they come across a large shadowy figure in the water. There, in the recesses of the frigid deep, lies the ship. The crew is silent for a moment, in awe of not only their own feet, but of the pristine artifact that lies before them. I think more than that, it just will inspire anyone that sees it with a, with a passion for exploration, for adventure, for getting out there and finding lost things. On March 5th, 2022, 100 years to the day of Shackleton's funeral off the coast of South Georgia Island, the Endurance was finally found, well preserved in the icy depths of the sea. Just like Shackleton, so too did the ship endure. This is just one tale of the hundreds the oceans, rivers, and caves have all swallowed before. I don't blame those that fear water, or its terrifying depths that absorb any amount of light, like a liquid black hole. Swimming in a cenote in Mexico, I felt that same overwhelming pull of the water and its insurmountable nature as I looked down and watched blue turn to black. Water completely overwhelms us. The ocean covers an overwhelming size of our globe, over two-thirds of the surface. To think we are the majority would be an astounding mistake. What we inhabit is a mere 5%. Yes, 5%. The deep takes up the rest. 95% of the space available for life belongs to the water. Indeed, we know more about the surface of the moon than we do our own ocean floors. In fact, we are so insignificant compared to the deep that the average depth of the oceans is 4 kilometers. The deepest point? More than 10 kilometers deep. You could place Mount Everest at the bottom of the ocean. Its peak wouldn't come close to the surface. We are but tiny animals floating on large pieces of rock, swimming in a giant pool we call Earth. And yet, we persist. Just like Shackleton, we brave the waters in the name of exploration, of bravery, and of the tremendous feats of mankind. One small swim for man. These incredible achievements surrounding water happen all the time, and while they can be mostly tragic, some are still inspirational. This is what's so fascinating about water. Not just the way we traverse it, but how we overcome it in the face of overwhelming adversity. To survive. To overcome. To endure. And I think this is true of much of the fiction we see in games, especially in water, albeit in various ways. As players, whether it be searching ruins, solving puzzles, fighting monsters, or undergoing exploration, we brave the depths all the same. We enter new worlds, dive into the cold, ethereal scapes of places long forgotten, ponder our surroundings in a place we as breathers do not belong in, if only for a few moments before returning to the surface once again. So when I hear someone say that they don't like water levels, I can't help but question that conclusion. But the music rocks, I'll say. Or have you seen that moment in Horizon? Really, it's a combination of so many aspects of game development that make water levels so unique and, more importantly, what makes playing through them so special. Are we not endurers ourselves? This is why I think water levels deserve more praise, because of how different they are, what things they hold, and what stories they tell. Everything from atmosphere, music, gameplay, and story, all wrapped in a subnautical sequence of the fear and wonder that is being underwater. And that's really all I'm trying to show, some of the little things that make up the elements of levels and games, to try and prove that, actually, water levels don't suck. Look, I understand where most people come from when they say they don't like water levels. One of the reasons why I think people say this is that there is always the chance movement doesn't feel right. I mean, it took Naughty Dog over 10 years just to make swimming feel good in the Uncharted series. Not to mention the anxiety of having to traverse underwater isn't always fun. 
But one thing I think water levels consistently nail is overall aesthetic, simply on a design standpoint, and how it can either change or reinforce a game's tone and pace, and sometimes how they can be in dialogue with themes. In his Fear of Depths video, Jacob Geller looks at Insight's water section and how its use of space reaffirms Insight's approach on fear, horror, and the sublime. This is the first time in the game we haven't been able to see the floor. It never even occurred to me that we wouldn't be able to see the floor, but here we are, floating above oblivion, and it's not claustrophobia anymore, and it's not the fear of drowning, it's just those depths. In this case, the water level succeeds, teasing out the harrowing secrets found underneath the lab, the insidious nature of what is inside. But what about on the other side of the spectrum? One that isn't tied to the anxiety of drowning or the dread of creatures from within the deep. In this case, water levels can actually evoke peace and tranquility. Take for instance Giant Squid's 2014 game, Abzu. In Abzu, you play as a diver exploring marine life throughout the ocean while slowly uncovering the history behind your ancestry. Of course, it isn't without eco-critical subtext as you help reintroduce various species back into their rightful ecosystems, but there's another layer interspersed through each of the levels, one that really isn't necessarily gameplay. Scattered throughout the game are these zen locations, meditation points your character can sit and observe the life swimming all around you. The camera leaves behind the third-person perspective, and we become omniscient, taking in the scenery as Austin Wintry's orchestral composition swims up to the foreground, and we watch. It's hard to call these sections gameplay. The only real controls are the sticks, one for camera and one for subject. But the intent is clear. We are meant to reflect on the beauty and precarity of the ocean creatures, even if they are just code, swimming along to the systems transcribed to them, each individual fish, turtle, or whale feels supremely indispensable. I'd argue these brief respites of observation are just as important as any eco-critical action the game makes us complete, if not more so. And you'd be surprised to discover how many more water levels are doing these sorts of things all the time, even in the games most people don't really like. For example, in Super Mario Sunshine, Nokia Bay concerns itself with these same elevations of the water level beyond gameplay. Through design, we can see the historical implications of searching through Nokia's depths trapped below the polluted waters, the remains of what once was. And even further are the comments on pollution from the old fishermen, forefronted as the incentive to the gameplay as Mario gathers his red coins for a shine sprite. It's these elements that make up the aesthetics of water levels that, in my opinion, makes them so good. But while we only touched on tone and design, no better is this illustrated than with ambiance. And this is where score comes in. This is aquatic ambiance composed by David Weiss for Coral Capers in Donkey Kong Country for the Super Nintendo, and its single-handedly changed composition for the rest of the game. Aquatic Ambiance is written on the Korg Wave Station, a synthesizer specializing in wave sequencing. It was the first synthesizer capable of generating complex sequences, sounding like a complete soundtrack with the press of a single key. Taking inspiration from Vangelis, why sought to take that same ambient style of sequence composition and applied it to his work on Donkey Kong. But in order to get the sequences ready for recording, let alone compose them in a way to create something that resembles a song, Wise first had to create the frequencies. This hadn't been done for the game yet. At this point, Coral Capers would be the first song in the game built using this architecture. Wise knew he had to get it right. This meant he had to sample several hundred frequencies, testing each sound to make sure everything was working together. And it wasn't just about finding the correct sounds, but also the correct rhythms, meticulously building everything on top of one another, and making sure the correct instruments, like the strings, stood out enough while the bass line stepped through each of the different waves. It took five weeks to finally come together. 
Finally, Wise is able to present his tune to Nintendo. It's gonna work, uh, and then presented it and said, well, this is what I've got for the aquatic um, area, or the, or the water level as I still call it. In fact, he was so excited about the way the composition came together that it ended up being his favorite track of the game. And more importantly, to find the rest of the game's soundtrack moving forward. Really, it goes beyond the level. Many people still consider Coral Capers one of the greatest water levels of all time, solely for Wise's influential score. And I think they're onto something here. Sure, the level still feels fun to play. Mashing B to swim up and avoid the fish inhabiting the level is fun. It's the right amount of challenge while still keeping gameplay simple. But it's the music that takes Coral Capers and the rest of Donkey Kong Country to the next level. Without the right ambiance in any setting, water levels just wouldn't be as good. But aesthetics can only take us so far. After all, we are talking about video games here. We still have to nail gameplay to consider a level good. If I had to discern which element of video games that make people say, water levels suck, it would have to be gameplay. Frankly, there's a lot of things that could go wrong when trying to make a water level feel good. A level's design could fall short, mechanics may not come together the way developers intended, or movement may not feel good to the player. And even if all these aspects come together, it still may not be fun. And this is what I suspect may be the culprit to the water level claim. Simply, not everyone thinks the gameplay, puzzles, or mechanics are fun in water levels. And as participants in the online space, where everyone has to have a take, we quickly dismiss these levels as bad. But rather than completely rejecting that as some kind of fallacy, I want to spend some time explaining how, maybe, we may just have some misconception on what it's like to play these levels. Look, I'll acquiesce a little. Not every design element is going to be perfect. Sometimes an idea, although executed wonderfully, still has shortcomings. Take for example Hydrus, the giant underwater colossi from Shadow of the Colossus. Due to the limitation of the PS2, massive underwater sections were just never going to look necessarily stunning. As impressive as it was for the hardware at the time, Shadow of the Colossus' realistic art style led to some difficulty spotting Hydrus maneuvering in the water. Naturally, this would lead to some frustration. But what Bluepoint did with 2018's remake is nothing short of genius. Rather than compromise the art style of the original, Bluepoint added glowing scales running along the side of the colossi, making it easier to follow in the water. This allows the original mood and tone through the game's art style to remain uncompromised while still making the overall encounter more approachable. This leaves us with a remake with one of the most sublime underwater encounters in gaming ever as Wander desperately holds on to the tail of a beast, diving deeper into the seemingly endless depths of the lake below. Separate frustrations can also arise with level design. In Mario 64, the water level of Wet Dry World changes depending on the height Mario jumps into the painting. As a kid, this layer of intricacy would make me anxious. Simply the not knowing would make me less excited to make my way through the level. But in time, I learned the fun was memorizing each of the locations to either raise or lower the water level. Interacting with the world deeper than just the way I moved as Mario, but in the mechanics of Wet Dry World, didn't just make the level more fun to play. It's great design, period. But how about something more controversial? One of gaming's most notorious water levels of all time. A level that, I don't think, really sucks at all. Look, I'll say it at the top, I think the Water Temple is a great dungeon. So far, half of the games I've mentioned in this essay alone have been Nintendo games. We know they can make a great water level. But just like the others, the Water Temple isn't without its criticisms. The biggest of which is inventory management. The Water Temple consists of three main floors, plus a basement, each with several rooms that are mostly inaccessible depending on where the water level is highest in the dungeon. In order to actually traverse the temple, Link has to equip his iron boots. The issue is that the boots aren't an item you can assign to one of the three C-stick buttons on the controller. Instead, you have to pause, switch over to the equipment screen, and select the boots. 
The design problem is that Link has to swim up and submerge so often that an average playthrough has players pausing between 30 to 50 times just to complete the temple. This one design element is what I believe to be the culprit of why people think the water temple isn't any good. And I can understand that claim. Honestly, having to pause over and over again, having this one flawed mechanic get in the way of gameplay, is frustrating. I'll even include having to memorize the locations of the three switches to either lower or raise the water level as an additional barrier to the temple's enjoyment. But similar to what Bluepoint did with Shadow of the Colossus, Nintendo did with the Ocarina of Time remake for the 3DS. On the DS, Nintendo included glowing colored arrows running along parts of the wall in the temple, guiding players to one of the three nearby switches. And more importantly, they changed the boots from equipment to an item, completely removing the most annoying element of the temple. With this barrier rectified, players could now swap the iron boots on and off instantaneously, leaving gameplay totally interrupted. So, if you accidentally went down a wrong hallway, you wouldn't have to worry about pausing just to switch shoes again. So I ask then, is it fair to assume that water levels are bad solely based on these minor annoyances from the water temple? Are there any other detractors keeping water levels from being good? Well, another criticism thrown against the temple is its overall complexity. In his video, Was the Water Temple Really That Bad? Monster Maze notes that the dungeon has double the rooms compared to any other dungeon in the game. Combined with its intricate design, we can start to see why many people make the claim that the Water Temple just isn't any good. But I don't think difficulty and complexity equates to bad design, nor would I make the jump that the Water Temple isn't any good, either. So let's try to highlight what makes this great. I think part of what makes the Water Temple fun is that same level of intricacy we just mentioned. Not too dissimilar from Wet Dry World, we have to remember the locations of the water switches in the Water Temple. The fun is in the experimentation of seeing how the varying water levels changes the dungeon. After that, it's all about following the right permutation of rooms. It's the Rubik's Cube of Zelda dungeons. What I do question, however, is how some people jump to the conclusion that the Water Temple is badly designed. Actually, it's quite a lot of people. But I want to reiterate that complexity doesn't necessarily equate to bad design. For example, when first entering the Water Temple, there's only one room that progresses the temple. The others are either dead ends, or the side room with the compass. You'll even be able to more easily identify the room that begins the temple, as Princess Ruto waits for you at the end of the hallway. On this, Monster Maze has something insightful to highlight, noting, This room is also quite genius because it acts as your first test to see if you understand the central mechanic of the dungeon and the consequences the different water levels have. It's sort of a miniature version of the central chamber. It too has three floors, with each floor granting or preventing access to a room depending on the water level. So not only is this room a signpost, meant to help guiding the beginning of Link's journey, it also tutorializes the mechanics of the entire temple, all within a minute of swimming up. Not to mention the top of this room leads to a chest with the dungeon's map. And speaking of signposts, as you swim up in this tutorial room, you'll be able to spot a cracked wall that can only be accessed while the water level is at the second floor. The game doesn't tell you this, but spends enough time lingering on the wall as Link floats up that it almost screams, go here. And these sorts of teases happen throughout the temple for those keen enough to spot them. What follows isn't drastically different from any of the other dungeons in Ocarina of Time. As long as you're observant, thorough in your search progressing from bottom to top, and routinely checking your map, you should be able to complete the temple without any major setbacks, simply by following the puzzles in each of the rooms to collect the keys. And this is where I think the Water Temple is at its strongest because we have to test to see if the map in our head correctly leads us down the right corridor based on how we've changed the environment. There's something cathartic about that gradual progression. For a more thorough analysis of the entirety of the Water Temple, I highly encourage you to check out Monster Maze's full video. Finally, after making your way through the dungeon, problem solving to the atmospheric scapes of the temple's theme, you enter a liminal space that shouldn't exist in this layout underground an open room with nothing but an endless foggy sky and shallow murky water. There are two pillars at the ends of this microcosm, and in the middle, the base of a dead tree. And it's only until Link runs across this space and reaches the doorway at the other side that you realize it's locked. You're stuck in here. 
Link turns around and you see it. A shadow standing at the roots, and that shadow is you. You fight the translucent figure, Dark Link, and Navi says that you have to conquer yourself. He swings his sword as you do, jumps as you do, and screams as you do. Eventually you take him down and you realize that wasn't even the final boss. Only a step on the way to conquering the water temple. A true test of courage. And thus the rest of the temple opens up. There's a neurological study by Patrick Fissler that researched what solving puzzles does to our brain. In it, he found that up to eight different cognitive functions activate at the same time. It's similar like meditation, like mindfulness training. Moreover, processing the information of the puzzle and making cognitive connections by internally solving led to long-term mental health benefits and even lowered the risk of Alzheimer's and dementia. And it's the training of these connections that makes us better thinkers. So then when we consider the complexity of the water temple, the act of playing, of solving the dungeon, becomes an active activity that targets brain functions that make us better thinkers. There's so much more research about how games help with building critical thinking skills, and I'd say the water temple is a prime example of such. If you're one of those people who thinks the water temple isn't good, I strongly recommend giving it another chance given the opportunity, especially now that many of us are older than when we first originally played Ocarina of Time. While it isn't perfect, its mystifying atmosphere and challenging design, I think, make it worthy as one of the best Zelda dungeons ever made. Because even if we find some of the menu interactions frustrating or its puzzles difficult, the fun is still in the gradual overcoming of each of the temple's floors. Now that we've looked at both aesthetics and gameplay, let's finally discuss how narrative can elevate the water level with some more modern examples. For me, water levels are at their strongest when they help service some aspect of the narrative. Especially in more modern titles, water sections work to support story elements of a game whether it be character building, environmental storytelling, or straight up part of the story. In The Last of Us, water sections are used as small puzzles meant to break up tense gameplay sections of combat and survival. But beyond brief respites, they also give players the opportunity to learn more about the two protagonists, Joel and Ellie. One thing we learn early on is that Ellie can't swim. She never learned how to. Thus, it is now our responsibility, playing as Joel, to look for alternate paths or platforms to help Ellie across areas with water. Some people found this repetitive, but I think it helps emphasize through gameplay that Joel is always there for Ellie. He is someone she can count on. So when Ellie falls into the water on the way to Salt Lake City, it hits harder because it's the one time we fail as a paternal figure, and we have to deal with that. But there are also storytelling elements built around water sections through the environment. In the first area of the game's fall chapter, Joel and Ellie come across a hydroelectric power plant. What's curious about the dam, however, is how it's still running now 20 years into the apocalypse. Surely, someone must be maintaining the dam to keep it running, right? Life must be nearby. As Joel and Ellie try to cross the gap to the other side of the dam, the bridge they bring up only gets them halfway. Joel must dive into the water to look for another solution. But beneath the surface lies the rubble of construction fallen from above some time before, and the ruins of one of the dam's previous buildings. A reminder that even if people have managed to survive nearby, the apocalypse still looms. Joel manages to get Ellie to the other side and the two share a moment of bonding. The smallest of high fives feels warm to people who were total strangers just a few months before. And water levels help facilitate these kinds of meditations all the time. Even in the shortest of sections, water levels can help illustrate themes with just a few minutes of gameplay, short moments of dialogue, or with things placed in the environment. But what happens when water gets a more prominent role in a game's mission? Well, in comes Horizon Forbidden West, and major spoilers ahead. In Horizon Forbidden West, 
Aloy must travel west to find three subordinate functions to help restore Gaia and stop Hephaestus, a rogue AI that is now trying to trigger an extinction protocol. One of your mission leads you into what is now the Mojave Desert, to the ruins of the once big city known as Las Vegas. Here, in the Sea of the Sands, is where Aloy must look for Poseidon. Journeying through the barren landscape, with some of the nearby vegetation giving way to the Pharaoh Plague, Aloy finally comes across the broken down buildings huddled together in the desert. Years of storm and decay have all but consumed most of the architecture. In one of the buildings Aloy climbs to scavenge, however, is a traveling group of entrepreneurs who mention an ancient city flooded under the sand. So, there's an ancient city under the sand, but it's flooded. Suddenly, a Nora Spearmaiden appears. Yeah, okay, um... You realize that the building you're in is just the tip of a concrete iceberg that sinks several hundred feet below. History, treasures, and your mission all trapped below the now submerged elevator shaft. Using various parts, a kneecap from a machine, a synthetic membrane as a filter, and a compressed air capsule, Aloy is now able to craft a portable diving mask, granting her access to areas underwater. Depending on how much side content you may or may not have done up to this point, this is the first time we truly get to see underwater in about 20 to 30 hours of playtime. Any sort of underwater exploration before, whether it be in caves or lakes, have only been short, narrow teases to the mission that now awaits us. So Aloy dives down the shaft and makes her way into a sunken casino that is otherwise dilapidated, save for clusters of holographic nautical lights. You continue, swimming out of the building and out into a murky lake, trapped inside a giant underground dome. Looking up, you realize you were trekking above, scavenging through the desert, just a few moments before. This entire micro-ecosystem has been here all this time, living beneath the sands. Here, at the foot of the lake, are the ruins of what was once the Vegas Strip. The mission is fairly straightforward from here. Aloy will have to swim to various points across the city to activate the pumps to drain the water in order to reach Poseidon. For the most part, there really isn't any combat in this section. Actually, there's no combat underwater at any point of the game. You simply swim and avoid any of the creatures and robots by hiding in kelp around the water. After successfully draining the surface section of the city, don't worry, the water still runs deeper below the streets so any living animals are still able to remain. And fighting against a Tide Ripper, Aloy finally makes it to Poseidon. This is where the water level becomes something truly special. Taking Poseidon triggers a restart of the city's power system. As you trek out of the data room and into the strip, you get a glimpse of what the city once was, soaking in all the sights all around you, as the ruins start to come back to life. You begin to climb back up through the once dead casino. What was once a cold, damp, desolate room is now warm, bright, and alive. You can almost hear the bustle from ages ago. Aloy climbs higher and higher and up out of the elevator, making it back out to the desert above and we hear that we have changed something. Not just below, but above as well. Aloy pushes back the curtain and she sees it. And this is the awe of what was Las Vegas, a sublime spectacle of the lights, a beacon of life in the middle of a plague-ridden desert. While the mission underwater isn't necessarily complicated to complete, it's the outcome that speaks to the notion of water levels elevating themes. Just think of what we know Las Vegas as, Sin City. No longer is that the case in the world of Horizon. Now, the city functions as a reclamation for humanity from the pain of survival and apocalypse. Vices aren't a negative here. Vegas is now a paradise from the constant anxieties in the decaying landscapes all throughout the world. To think these buildings have survived for decades, generations even, enduring the weather and the reclamation from extinction events, to remain, not just standing, but functioning, even when drowned in water for who knows how many years, is the very embodiment of Shackleton's endurance. It's not just the buildings that have endured, 
but the spirit and history of humanity altogether emerging from these relics. And I'm not sure this moment would have been as powerful if it weren't for playing to the water level first. This is what water levels can do. They can slow down gameplay to highlight mood and make us think about what surrounds us as players. In dialogue with its mechanics, they can challenge us to make us better thinkers and explorers. And beyond gameplay, they can emphasize themes of endurance through interactivity with characters and the narrative we are experiencing. And there's so many more games we could talk about. We didn't even look at games like Soma, Wind Waker, and countless more Mario games. And look, you don't even have to agree with all my examples. I understand that games, and the way we enjoy them, are extremely subjective. Really, my only goal was to show off what I think are great examples of water levels in some of my favorite games, and how the elements that make up the levels are instrumentally more important than many of us actually realize. And who knows? Maybe I was able to make someone out there reconsider whether or not a water level is actually good, even if just for a moment. Because even if someone doesn't like them, or just parts of them, we can at least appreciate these levels for what they are trying to do. So by the time you get to the end of this video, you can hopefully agree, water levels don't suck. Thanks so much for watching this video. Don't forget to sub to the channel to get more videos like this one, video essays I do on games and movies, and of course, all the podcasts we do here on The Penultimate Conquest. Hope you enjoyed, and we'll see you on the next one.